Welcome to the fifth Early Career Researcher um, ICMRBS webinar. Um, so it's a new year, so we're going to try a new format. Um, so why are we changing things? Well, uh, we thought that we might like a bit more interaction at these, these webinars than we're having before. We had great talks before, um, but we tend to just listen to the talks, ask a few questions, and then we were gone. So we thought this time, let's try and shorten the talks, um, really quick talks, uh, and then move out into breakout rooms uh, to try and have some, some, some better discussion. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have um, three rapid talks from our speakers, um, and we're going to ask that no one asks any questions at, the, at that point. So if you've got a question, write it down uh, and save it for the breakout room. Um, also, during these talks, um, please um, don't turn your audio on. So you'll notice we are in a meeting format. Um, so please don't turn your audio on during that time. You can turn your video on if you want. It's probably a bit weird. Um, and please don't record the talks. So we're going to hear 10 minute talks from each of our three speakers. Uh, and then we're going to try and move into breakout rooms. Now this might be slightly experimental. Um, but down the bottom right of your screen, maybe not now, maybe later, there'll be the option to select a breakout room. And so one speaker will be in one, the other speakers will be in the other. Um, and you can join those breakout rooms, turn your video on, turn your audio on. And hopefully we can have a bit more of a chat like we might have at a conference um, rather than typing typing questions and, and not having a lot of interaction. So in order to be able to pick your breakout room, we worked out that you either have to join via a browser or update your Zoom to a suitable version. Um, so if you haven't updated your Zoom, you might find that you can't join a breakout room. If that's the case, don't worry, we're gonna try and manually put you into a breakout room. Like I said, it might be slightly experimental, but hopefully what, what that means is, is that we'll all be able to see each other and have a proper chat about, about the work that's, that's being presented today. Um, and then after the breakout sessions, we're going to come back to the main room to continue any discussions that, that people might want to have, and, and that will go on for as long as it as long as it needs to, really. Um, so, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, um, Lyara, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, and uh, start your talk. Okay, just quickly share my screen. Hello, everybody. So my name is Layara. I'm a postdoc in Stefan Greshek Group in Switzerland. And today I will talk a bit about uh, what I have been doing here for the last couple of years regarding G protein coupled receptors. But first, I would like to thank the organizers for this nice getting together time. I think this is really important. And in these difficult times, I think this is fantastic to have something like this. So uh, G protein coupled receptors, also known as GPCRs. Uh, are proteins which are involved in many vital functions in the human body and therefore they are very important drug targets. And now you may ask me what they do that they are so important, right? And I can tell you that GPCRs are very versatile chemical sensors which stay in the surface of the cells and they can recognize very different ligands from the outside of the cell ranging from photons to small molecules and proteins. So they transmit this signal across the plasma membrane to the inside of the cell and then uh, we have very different cellular response uh, upon this signaling. And although different GPCRs can recognize very different ligands, all of them share the same architecture, which consists in seven transmembrane helices, and they also share the same mechanism of signal transduction. Okay. We are working with adrenergic receptors, which are GPCRs that can sense amines and they participate on fight or flight responses. That means that those receptors tell our body what to do when we are in danger or in a stressful situation. And they do that by sensing uh, their natural agonist, which is adrenaline. The ligands in a very simplified way, they can be divided into agonists and antagonists. Agonists such as adrenaline binds to the receptor and then uh, they just uh, freeze the receptor in a preactive state, which may lead to a, a biological response. Whereas antagonists, such as the beta blockers we find on drug stores, they compete for the same binding pocket, but they block the receptor in an inactive state. 
And although there are many, many crystal structures and nowadays also cryo-EM structures of different receptors bound to either agonists or antagonists, when we compare those structures for the same receptor, we can appreciate how similar they are. And this is very surprisingly because we would expect that their structure would uh, reflect their functional difference, but this is not true in this case. In fact, GPCRs can only be fully active in the presence of an intracellular partner, which is a G-protein or a G-protein mimicking nanobody, in this case, nanobody 8, and they bind to the intracellular side of the receptor. And this leads to a fully active conformation. In this case, there are some differences in the structure. Then here, I just removed the intracellular part, uh, partner for the sake of clarity to show you that basically the difference between the preactive and the active state is a swing out motion of these two helices here. And of course, by just looking at those structures, it's not clear for us how this activation happens. It's also known that GPCRs are very uh, flexible molecules and they experience different conformations at any particular functional state. So understanding deeply this uh, equilibrium is a very important part to fully understand how GPCRs execute their tasks. And this is what we intend to do. In other words, we want to understand what happens in the receptor between the extracellular recognition of a ligand until it gets to a G protein activation. For this, we use high pressure NMR and the beta-1 adrenergic receptor has a model, which I will call from now on only beta-1. We do this by having the receptor rec reconstituted in detergent micelles. We use selective labeled uh, valines for this, and those valines are assigned by point mutations. This was done some time ago in our group, and from this we could see what's the difference uh, in the three different functional states. Uh, very briefly, just a quick reminder, we have the receptor with an agonist, and this is the preactive state. We add the nanobody 8, this goes to a ternary complex, which is fully active, and by adding on top of it an antagonist, which has higher affinity, this ternary complex is dissolved, and we have the receptor blocked in an inactive state. Comparing the trose spectra for preactive and inactive state, we can see how similar they are. And in fact, we only see an important difference when we go for the ternary complex, which is fully active. Those differences are mainly around the ligand binding pocket, as I show here with these um, magenta arrows. And this shows the allosteric coupling between the two sides of the receptor because we bind the nanobody 8 in the intracellular side. And this is reflected by chemical shift difference in the extracellular side. Another thing uh, that's interesting to see is that in the preactive state, we see some valines which present two peaks. And this means we have an equilibrium between two conformations which are in slow exchange. And this we don't see neither in the active or the inactive state. So now we know how the spectrum looks like in these three different functional states. And the next step is to perturb the system in order to get more information about this equilibrium. We do this by applying pressure, and it's known that every time you apply pressure to a system, the equilibrium shifts towards the, to the state which has the smallest molar volume. And the volume difference between the two states can be calculated by the relationship between the population ratio or the Gibbs free energy difference between these two states and the applied pressure at a constant temperature. Just to illustrate how this works, we have a zircon tube where we place our sample. This is filled to the top with paraffin oil. This is connected to a pressure line, which goes from the magnet until this pressure builder here. Everything is filled with this paraffin so that when we turn the wheel, we can increase the hydrostatic pressure. Our first experiment was to compare the spectrum at one bar in black and 2,500 bar in red. This is the inactive state, and we see that uh, most of the chains are following the same direction, which I point here with cyan arrows. And this is moving uh, downfield, both for protons and nitrogen-15, meaning that the hydrogen bonds are getting compressed or shorter. This is what we expect for any protein we put under pressure, actually. And we see the same for the active state, although we have less assignments in this case for 
all of those we could follow, we see the same normal compression. On the other hand, in the preactive state where we have the agonist, we see big shifts and they go in the opposite direction, uh, showing that the hydrogen bonds are getting stretched and also that we have a, a backbone distortion. And we map where are these big chains and we see that they are around the ligand binding pocket, meaning that here it's more compressible than in the inactive or the active state. By comparing with the inactive state, we can uh, think that this is because the antagonist has a larger uh, head group, which fulfills better this binding pocket. And therefore, this is also reflected in the fact that the antagonists have a higher affinity than the agonist. On the other side, uh, it's not so straightforward to rationalize what happens to the active state because the ligand in this case is exactly the same. So uh, to better understand what's happening, we just compare here the preactive state in black and the active state in orange at one bar and 2,500 bar. And the difference at one bar actually reflects the intrinsic difference between the two populations. What's nice to see here is actually that the second peak I told you about in the preactive state is actually the fully active state, which is less populated here. But what's astonishing is to compare both at 2,500 bar. And here we see that both spectrum are basically the same. They're almost identical, meaning that the receptor in the preactive state can go to the fully active state by only applying pressure, even without any intracellular partner. And this is the first time someone showed that GPCRs can be activated without a G protein or a G protein mimicking nanobody. So that's pretty cool. And this also means that this activation mechanism is quite robust and the protein kinds of know what to do even without the intracellular partner. Now we know that the receptor can be activated by pressure and we were asking ourselves how much the receptor needs to shrink in order to be activated. And to learn more about this, we performed the pressure titration from one bar to 2,500 bar. And here you can appreciate how the spectrum gradually changes, and also the proportion between the two peaks of the two different populations also changing. But this it becomes much more clearer if I just zoom in in the region of one of those resonance. Here is valin 202, which sits only in the top of the ligand. And here uh, we show the proportion of the two populations reactive and active, and this we can easily calculate by the difference in the intensity of this resonance. And here you easily see that the active state is getting more populated under higher pressures. And from this population ratio, we can derive the Gibbs free energy difference between these two states at any pressure point. This is what we did. And by plotting the delta G by the pressure points we have, you see this nice linear fit here. And from the slope of this curve, we get the delta V, which is around minus 96 cubic angstrom, meaning the fully active state is around 100 cubic angstrom is smaller than the preactive state, which is quite a lot. And the question that follows from this is where is the volume lost, right? And we can imagine a first uh, situation where we have a state A, which is a protein that has an empty cavity, completely empty. We apply pressure to it and it goes to a state B, which indeed has a smaller volume. But we can also think about a second situation where you have a state C, which instead have a water-filled pocket uh, and you apply pressure to it and these waters are just uh, we squeezed out. But in this case, in the state D, we don't have a net volume reduction. On contrary, Actually, it even gets a bit bigger because the water volume in bulk is slightly larger than inside the protein. Uh, so in this case, we can't change this equilibrium by only applying pressure. For us, this means that the beta-1 must have empty cavities inside the the, its structure. So uh, then we were curious to know where is this empty space inside the protein? And we calculate the empty spaces uh, using crystallography, uh, crystallographic structures, which were available for the preactive and active states. We divided it into three different regions. And then the most obvious thing is the extracellular pocket, because we have this ligand binding pocket here. And indeed, it gets smaller. 
but this doesn't account for the 100 cubic angstrom we saw by NMR. So going further on, we saw that in the center of the receptor, we have a number of smaller uh, voids, which also get uh, smaller in the active state. And we think this is very important because in theory, this is less accessible to water and any change here will contribute a lot for the whole volume reduction. And the intracellular side, we know that this gets wider to accommodate the intracellular part in the active state. So taking all this together, we have a concerted motion where we have uh, the compression of the top and the center and the opening on the opposite side. And this could be random, but it isn't. And actually this directional movement uh, very much resembles uh, this helicy uh, movement outwards that I told you in the beginning of the talk. So what we found new here is a new component uh, for this activation mechanism, which is the repacking of the top and the center of the receptor. With this, I would like to conclude my talk and the take home message here is that GPCRs can be activated without any intracellular partner and that the active state is smaller than all the other states. And also that this uh, volume reduction must be caused by the collapse of completely empty cavities. Actually, these completely empty cavities are very important, important for function. And we think that this is not only the case for GPCRs, but also for other enzymes. And maybe that it's a new interaction principle in proteins. So I would like to thank the whole Greshek group, especially Professor Stefan, the Swiss National Science Foundation for funding my project, Biocentrum, and again, the ICMRBS ECR committee for uh, letting me share a bit of our science here today. Thank you for your attention, and I hope to see you in the breakout room and hopefully answer some questions. Thank you very much. That was great. And yes, if you've got a question, write it down, remember it, you know, and save it for the breakout room. We're going to move straight on now to Luis, um, who is going to introduce himself and, and his talk. Thank you very much. So can you see it? That's right. Yep. No, thanks, Nick. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the ECR for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be back in the NMR community to discuss with you guys. I've been out for a while. So I'm a postdoctoral fellow here in Brazil, uh, in the University of Sao Paulo over the last two years. And I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we've been doing with this family of protein called GRASPs and how they manage their conformational flexibility to handle this promiscuous interactron that we can observe in vivo. So GRASPs are named as Golgi reassembly and stacking proteins. It's a very suggestive name because GRASPs, the first functionality associated to GRASP was grasping opposite membranes and building these Golgi stacks in the mammalian cells. So GRASP is one of the main components of the Golgi matrix. So responsible for keeping the Golgi structuration and also all its dynamics during conventional cell cycle. And because it's so important for the Golgi structuration, it's important for secondary functionalities that requires the Golgi, like the conventional exocytic pathway, especially correct protein glycosylation. But it's also directly involved in, in other processes, including Golgi disassembly and reassembly mitosis, Golgi fragmentation and apoptosis, and also more recently, this unusual participation in unconventional protein secretion, where under cell stress, these grasps are turned off from the Golgi complex and go to other cell compartments to perform additional functionalities, especially in this transport of proteins that do not require the conventional exocyte. So GRASP basically regulates protein trafficking either via modulating Golgi stack structure and vesicle budding, but also through direct interaction with specific molecules. And this is where it lies my, uh, my presentation. GRASPs can re uh, recruit and can attach several different proteins during its functionality, not only in the UPS, the conventional protein secretion, but also in the normal Golgi maintenance, in recruiting Golgi genes, recruiting, recru recruiting sorting receptors, and also all kinds of enzymes that facilitate post-translation modifications in the Golgi. Uh, basically, its structure is divided into main regions, or any terminus half, that we call the GRASP domain. It's highly conserved. It's myristolated in the any terminus, and it's formed by two PDZ domains connected in tandem. And there is also this C-terminal region that's a huge one. It's fully disordered, rich in serine and proline residues. 
and uh, it has a regulatory functionality and also gives grasp some unusual biophysical like properties like uh, uh, liquid liquid phase separation properties and also amyloid like aggregate. So in, talking about how grasp can interact with different proteins, it mainly uses its N terminus half that's composed of these two PDZs. And we know that PDZ domains bind to short regions of this C terminus of other specific proteins. And that's where I want to call the attention. Uh, PDZ bind to specific proteins, so specific signals that are usually located at the C terminus of the protein partner. And just in humans, for instance, we have more than 900 PDZs that are distributed over 400 uh, different proteins. So PDZs cannot be very promiscuous. If not, they are going to bind everything. But grasps are very promiscuous. And so far we have found several different uh, protein partners that were already associated to grasps. Mostly of them in the unconventional secretory pathway, but there are several also in the regular Golgi mountains. And I just updated this list today and I got these two other proteins. So I think more and more will probably be added to the list if I keep updating it. So we would like to answer why grasp speed sets are so promiscuous in mediating protein-protein interaction. And also that most of these interactions that were solved in a molecular level, they were all using the binding pocket of PDZ1. And this was not so clear so far to us. So we would like to answer that, why there is this asymmetry between both PDZs when it comes to interact with different protein partners. From the crystal structures, we could not see much. So for the mammalian grasp is both PDZs, they are They behave very much alike if you show them. So lots of big differences that we could uh, assume or use it to explain this difference or this promiscuity. So if it's not structured, it might be dynamics. And of course it would be dynamics. If not, I will not be here in the MMR heat. So working the grasp uh, with the isolated grasp domain, so the two that's connected in tandem. What we know for most of the systems that we have studied so far is that they behave as molten globule like proteins. So what does that mean? So it means that they are collapsing proteins, but they have a great number of hydrophobic sites that are water exposed. So it gives, the, it gives them this high ANS affinity. That's a characteristic, a hallmark of molten globules. They have considerable amount of ordered secondary structures, uh, what is clear from the crystal structure, but also solution. But the tertiary contexts that keep this structure together they are not really strong. So they go through this low cooperativity in the unfolding transition. And it's not only in the, with the urea, so a caltropic agent, but also the temperature. They have multiple sites of disorder, so a very limited proteolysis. And they give this very uh, unique fingerprinting in the NMRHSQC. So most of the lines are too broad to be detected. So beyond our limit of detection, spectrum because molten globules have this conformation and fluctuation that's in this characteristic time scale of microsecond to millisecond. So we cannot just, we can just not see them. So for this model grasp that we are using here, we can observe more or less 10% of the total expected resonance lines. So to get information of this massive spectra, what we did, we first performed the assignment of the fully unfolded uh, grasp, uh, grasp structure, so nine molar urea, we got a pretty good assignment. And then we transferred the assignment all the way from the nine molar to the zero molar condition by spectral superposition. So how we did that, we first standardized our titration experiment, where we went from zero to nine molar in a one molar steps. And by spectral superposition, we just assigned for all these 10 uh, conditions what would be the HN resonances. And to get information from that, actually stability information, what we did, so besides uh, these peaks that we could see here in the zero molar conditions that were probably from very disordered region because of this narrow potent dispersion, all the other ones were in what we considered should be the folded state. So if we start to see a peak during our titration, so for instance, in the three molar urea, we assumed that that was the urea concentration necessary to unfold that particular region. So by taking no note of what would be the urea concentration necessary for each residue that we could assign and we could track, we end up with this graph. So it's where we start to see the first differences between both PDZs. So we can clearly see that in PDZ1, we have this huge area here 
that comprehends more than 60% of the PDZ-1, that is highly flexible. So the resonance lines, most of them were already in the zero molar condition, but also of very low stability. So we could also we could already see them in the one molar urea concentration. And the second part of the PDZ that's located in the end, and this is important to see how it is behaving in the beginning and in the end. We have in the end a more, uh, let's say, stable structure and it's probably more well behaved. While in PDZ2 is much more stable and really behaves as a well folded, well structured protein. And what is interesting is that this NMR data that we got, this uh, stability and dynamic data, correlates pretty well with the the B factors that we can observe on the crystal, the crystal structures. So it's a kind of a notion of flexibility that we can get from the, the crystallography. So it seems that the PDZ1 is indeed not only more stable, but also more flexible. How can we get more information from this? So by remembering that the PDZ, uh, for, the, for the protein to interact with the PDZ, the partner C terminus region binds to the PDZ domain by beta sheet augmentation, and this is basically involving the beta 2 strand that is uh, in purple here. Um, what controls the axis of the binding block and also perform additional interaction is the alpha 2 helix. And in Ingraspis, we have a very unusual uh, PDZ fold that comes from the crystallography. So in Graspis, we have the beta 1 and beta 2 strand that are usually at the beginning for eukaryotic PDZs. But in graspers, they are located at the end of the protein sequence. So basically, what we have in the binding part of PDZ1 is a stable beta 2 strand, but an unstable and apparently much more flexible alpha helix 2. So, what controls the access to the binding part is much more promiscuous. So, that's why we believe that it makes PDZ1 more promiscuous in mediating these interactions. But still, uh, if PDZ1 was too, would be too, uh, too promiscuous, the affinity would not, would not be higher for sure. So PDZ2 might assist this interaction somehow. And from some crystal structures that now we have available, we've observed this uh, specific pattern where we could see this change of the orientation uh, from PDZ2 towards PDZ1 that's kind of driven by the interaction with the protein partner. It's actually some secondary interactions that the protein partner can do with the PDZ2. So to explore this conformational flexibility in more details, we performed ABF and molecular dynamic simulations to sample this conformational free energy profile of the GRASP domain, basically by monitoring how uh, the PDZ1 and PDZ2 can move towards each other, how would be this conformational flexibility. And for the apple form, we have this data. So we can see that the available area for the apple GRASP, so the apple form, to move or to have these dynamics, it's kind of big at 37 Celsius degrees. So it allows a, a larger movement between PDZ1 and PDZ2. But when we take into account the presence of the, the protein partner, this, uh, this conformation is strongly collapsed. So it really locks GRASP in one particular conformation. And this is curious because more and more crystal structures start to show up in the literature with different protein partners. And it was clear from these structures that the protein partner performs different interactions with PDZ2 if we compare with one another. And all of them have different orientation between PDZ1 and 2. But what is interesting is that all these different conformations, they could be mapped in our uh, ABF simulation as available conformations, at least free energy available conformations. So they were already present in the apple form at 37, 37 Celsius degrees. So basically it means that GRASP's PDZs are structurally organized to provide a smooth energy landscape that allow the domain orientation to be flipped after the ligand binding. So that's how we believe GRASP can uh, kind of use the, or can achieve its promiscuous interaction. So first uh, would be an uh, interaction with the PDZ1 binding pocket, which is more promiscuous, so it's more, um, more easily accept a different protein partner. And also by this conformation of flexibility at, at room temperature allows this grasp domain to, to do large movements. So make these different conformations accessible for different protein partners. So allow these protein partners to perform uh, interactions that are protein partner specific. So it's a couple of mechanisms. So I would like to thank my boss, so Antonio Costa here from the University of Sao Paulo. 
a doutora Mariana Bonoro, who performed all the molecular dynamic simulations, my, my collaborators, especially people from Oxford, who received me during my PhD, the people who paid me, and all of you for watching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So yes, if you've got a question, save it for the breakout rooms, they're coming soon. Um, but we're gonna pass over to Raynal, who will introduce herself and, uh, and start a talk, thanks. Hello, uh, can, can everybody hear me? Yep, yep that's good. Uh, hi, okay. Um, hi everyone, um, uh, my name is Ray. Um, uh, I am. I just started my uh, independent um, uh, position in University of Guelph um, in Canada. Um, so first, I'd like to thank the organizers for this terrific series of webinars and also for the invitation. So um, before I start, uh, first, I'd like to um, acknowledge the teams that were involved in the work that I'm going to present you today. So this work is mostly done uh, in my postdoc um, supervisor, Dr. Louis Caselab. And I'd like to thank Louis for uh, his guidance and continuous support. And Docs, uh, Dr. Alex um, Conacella is equally contributed to this work. And also like to, I'd like to thank their, um, our collaborators in uh, the Rubinstein Lab, Shuck Lab, and um, Adventure School Lab, um, and the fundings. So the work that I'm, that I'm going to tell you today is on the interactions between a uh, AAA ATPase um, P97 and its adapter P47 using solution NMR and other uh, biophysical techniques. So P97 is a highly conserved and versatile ATPase, which participates in a variety of cellular functions, including ERAD and autophagy and uh, membrane remodeling. So to recruit P97 to these various functions, um, more than 30 adapter proteins um, interacts with P P97. One of them is uh, P47, which navigates P97 to mediate the assembling of Golgi apparatus. So during mitosis, the Golgi apparatus would dissemble into the mem membrane fragments to partition into the daughter cells. Well, after cell division, these fragments uh, will reassemble back to Golgi membrane with the assistance of the uh, P97, P47 complex. So the membrane fusion ma machinery actually involves another um, d ubiquitinating enzyme and a snare protein as a substrate. And so far, uh, there's no structure of this complex. So our work here is um, kind of like the initial steps towards getting a, a structural understanding of, of this complex, um, which is to characterize the interaction between P97 and the full length P47. So P97 is a um, homohexamer, um, as you can see here, with each of its sub subunits um, consisting of a N-terminal domain um, and two ATPase domains. And so these two domains uh, forms two stacked rings, D1 ring and D2 ring, and the NTD, um, which interacts with most of the um, adapter proteins, can adopt two conformations uh, depending on the nucleotide state of D1. So it's either it can be an up conformation, uh, one that's bound with ATP, um, or it can be a down conformation uh, when the D1 is loaded with ADP. The adapter uh, of interest here, uh, the P47, is a 41 kilodalton protein consisting of three distinct domains. Um, connected by intrinsically disordered linkers. The UBA domain uh, interacts, binds, and uh, recruits ubiquitinated substrates uh, to the complex. And um, the UBX um, interacts with the NTD of P97. The biological function of the middle septic domain is not yet known. Um, and there is also a, a linear uh, motif ship, which also interacts with the P97, uh, the n terminal domain. So, so far, um, the structural studies between these two proteins are mostly uh, based on fragments. So the, also the function of this long stretched of linkers um, are not known. And the stoichiometry of the binding um, is also not characterized well. And we also don't know whether there's any difference um, in the interaction between these two proteins between different uh, nucleotide states um, of P97. So these are the kind of questions that we try to address with our study here. So 
So it has been long believed in the literature that the full length P47 forms a nanomolar affinity trimer. So when we um, started to work on the full length P47, it kind of surprised us that this supposedly uh, 120 kilodalton trimer um, gave such a beautiful a backbone HSQC spectrum uh, for which we can obtain 90% of the backbone and NH assignment, as well as most of the um, resolved methyl groups. In addition, uh, we also um, fail to detect any intermolecular NOEs uh, between the methyl groups um, in P47. And also, we don't observe any um, concentration-dependent chemical shift perturbations over a large concentration range. So to really convince ourselves the oligomerization state of P47, we did um, dynamic light scattering where we compared um, the diffusion coefficient of the P47 with a monomeric construct. We also did a pull down assay um, uh, with a his tagged and tagless P47 um, and failed to see any pull down. And um, in addition, we used um, um, AUC and um, analytical algae identification and small angle x ray, um, the results of which. Um, all points to the fact that the full length P47 is actually a monomeric in contrast to what people have previously thought. So when we were investigating P47 by itself, we also found that this uh, intrinsic disordered linker actually contained a con conserved motif, which we call SIM, that interacts with the middle septoming. We can see chemical shift perturbations, um, both on the linker and on the sept domain when we titrated these two pieces together. And we identified the binding interface on the sept domain. So, and we, we also in, in observed NOEs uh, between uh, methyl groups from these two parts. So due to this um, intramolecular interaction, the structure of the P47 is actually more compact than what we previously thought. Now, to study the interaction between P47 and P97, we use the shorter construct of P97, uh, which contains uh, the, only the NTD and D1 um, to, get, um, to improve our spectral quality. We confirmed with chemical shift perturbations and ITC that this shorter construct um, is actually sufficient and serves as a good model to study the complex formation between these two proteins. So as previously reported, P47 interacts with P97 um, with its ship motif and the UBX domain, um, both bind binding to the NTD of P97. Interestingly, we discovered that these two actually are not the only binding site. There is an additional binding site on P47, which can uh, also bind to P97. So we identified site um, from chemical shift perturbations and also a differential line broadening here. Um, the location of the site is actually um, on, also on the flexible linker uh, between UBA and the step domain. It's marked in green box here. And it turns out that the sequence of this new site um, is actually homologous to uh, the previously identified ship motif. So we call this new site um, N and the previous uh, ship, ship C. And we also confirmed um, with chemical shift perturbations that this new site, the ship N site, also binds to the same spot or the same surface um, on the NTD of P97 as um, other ship motifs. So in fact, um, the P47 can interact with P97 with a maximum of three binding sites, the two ship sites uh, motifs and uh, the UBX domain. Because P47 um, was previously thought to be a trimer, so um, the binding stoichiometry of the, um, the interactions were proposed to be a one P47 trimer uh, to one P97 hexamer. But now that we know that P47 actually exists um, as monomers in solution, um, then what is really um, the stoichiometry of the binding? Then? Uh, we can observe by an MR titration that actually one P97 hexamer can bind to up to six P47 molecules. And 
We can also use uh, Crowd EM uh, conducted in the Rubinstein lab. If we focus on the density of UBX domain of P47, we actually can see all 14 unique configurations of the complex of P47, um, P97, P47, which would, would be one would, which would be something that uh, one would expect for a monomer to bind to a hexamer. So we've established that there are at most three uh, binding sites on P47, um, the UBX domain and two uh, ship motifs. The UBX and ship C are, are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they can bind um, to NTD at the same time, um, the same NTD, uh, but the two ship motifs, um, they uh, bind to the same spot on the NTD. So they cannot, uh, they are, um, they cannot bind to the same NTD um, at the same time, right? So describe, to describe the binding, uh, we came up with a model um, in which um, a P47 molecule can either interact with the P97 in a tripartite manner where the UBX and the ship C bind to the same entity and why the ship M binds to one of the neighboring entities. Or it can interact in a bipartite manner uh, where only ship C and UBX binds without ship M binding due to um, in the case where uh, the neighboring entities are not available for the binding. So we can describe these two binding modes with um, these two uh, uh, KDs um, um, respectively. And if we, under this premise, for a hexameric P40, uh, P90, P97 with varied number of bound P47s, there are in total a of 76 unique conf configurations um, uh, describing that. And here there are a few of the uh, examples shown here. And each of the populations of this configuration can be described by these two uh, binding affinities. So using this model, we can actually fit our ITC data and NMR titration data and get consistent KD values to describe these two um, binding modes um, where um, for the bipartite binding is around 0.5 micromolar and um, it's a 0.15 or 1.4 micromolar binding for the tripartite binding mode. Now, since P P97 actually undergoes large conformational change depending on the nucleotide state. So our next question we ask is that whether uh, the nucleotide state of P97 affects um, the interaction uh, with P47. So we first did ITC experiments, titrating wild type P47 into a P97 uh, in different nucleotide states, an APO state and AD ADP state. And we can clearly see that there is a, a a drastic difference in binding enthalpy and uh, the apparent binding stoichiometry here between these two states. Now, using different construct, um, we were able to identify um, that this difference actually comes from whether or not a uh, ship M motif can bind. So we find that the ship M motif uh, only binds to APO P97, but not to P97 in the ADP state here. So in other words, the tripartite binding only happens um, uh, in the APO state, but um, in the ADP state, um, there is only bipartite binding. We also recorded um, the backbone spectra of P47 in complex with P97, um, with P47 either in the wild type or uh, with a mutation in the ship M motif from the differential line broadening between the two nucleotide states here. We can see that, also see that uh, the binding of ship N is uh, dependent on the nucleotide state of P97. So to summarize our findings, uh, we have characterized um, the oligomerization state of P47 using a few techniques and found that um, it's monomeric in contrast to what people have believed. And we also identified a intramolecular interaction between the linker um, and the septoming, which may restrict the conformational space of P47 um, when it interacts with substrates. Uh, we also identified a new binding motif in P47, uh, the ship M motif. Um, and this, this motif actually interacts with P P97 in a nucleotide dependent uh, manner. So, 
future work is still needed um, to figure out whether exactly what structurally um, lead to uh, these two different binding modes in different nucleotide states and uh, what is actually uh, the physiological role of switching between um, the two binding modes um, when P97 is uh, going through the nuclear, uh, nucleotide hydrolysis cycle. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. And um, I'd like to see people, if you have any questions, I'd like to see people in the breakout room. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, so now don't go anywhere.